Mark IV, three and a half to ten power, my 40 millimeter, diameter of the ejector lens, the front lens, and LRT. LRT is long range tactical. That's the little full designation for it. It is a three and a half to ten power magnification. Fire relief is. Okay, the distance from between your eye and that ocular lens, all right, that's the $5 word for the lens at the back you look into. All right, go ahead, everybody go ahead and uh, open up your scope covers. All right. And make sure, you're, make sure your optic is all the way up to 10 power. All right, now put your head up, put your eye behind the scope and start moving your head forward and back. What happens to what you see? Gets, gets bigger and smaller, right? Your field of view through the optic. All right, when you have your correct eye relief, you have that full field of, that maximum field of view through the optic. All right, now crank your optic down to three and a half power. And move your head back and forth. A little more forgiving, isn't it? You got a little more room for error there before it starts getting bigger and smaller. All right. So when we set your eye relief, what do you think we set it at? Maximum power. Because if it is correct at maximum power, it will be correct for anything lower than that. All right. But it's important we set that up. One of the things that we're going to do, first thing that we're, you're going to do on the range when we set the weapons up, is you're going to set up the length of pull on your buttstock. All right, once you do that, you need to set it to where it's comfortable for you. The next thing I suggest you do is mark it, wherever it is on those rails. You take 100 mile an hour tape and stick it on that rail or whatever. All right. You want to do that when you mark them. If you want to put tape on there, you want to put it on the front side. Why do you think that is? Because it can't go further back, but I can go in. I don't want to put it on both sides. Because once you set your length of pull, normally you're not going to go longer, but you're going to, you, but you very likely will go shorter. Why do you think that is? Okay. Different position. Body armor. All right. The way you have to take a shot, you may have to adjust that stock. And if you adjust it, Generally speaking, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to have to adjust it in. All right. Okay, your elevation. Your elevation on your turret. Every click on that elevation knob is one minute of angle. Okay, your windage, which is the one on the right-hand side, every click on that is one half minute of angle. Okay, your elevation turret also has a bullet drop compensator in it. We'll, we'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay, and again, magnification must be on 10 power for proper range estimation. The reason why that is, is that optics are made in a variety of different ways. Right? If you were to look inside of this optic, you would see multiple lenses stacked in there. Right? They are in, there is a tube inside of this tube. It's called the erector tube. When you adjust for elevation and windage, as I turn my knob, what it's doing is it's pushing on that inner tube, and it's moving it right or left and up and down. Right, and that's how, I, that's how an internal adjustment scope works. Now, your reticle. There are two different ways to mount reticles. Right, they're called first focal plane and second focal plane. Basically what that means is where in that stack of lenses your reticle is actually etched onto the glass. All right, the difference being these are what's called a second focal plane reticle. All right, that is why when I adjust my power, all right, my mirror relation doesn't work on anything but one power setting. When sniper optics first came out, Right, variable power scopes on these types of weapons are a relatively recent thing. Okay, they used to all be fixed 10 power. 
They, they kind of find out, found out now that variables are a little bit better idea. Why didn't Mike think that that is? Exactly, especially for an SDM, because you guys may be, you know, hopefully the enemy is going to be six, seven, eight hundred yards away from you when you engage them, right? But is that a given? No, right? They may be at handshake distance. Right? They may be 50 yards away okay? because of the nature of what you do versus the nature of what a sniper does. All right? On a first focal plane reticle, or first focal plane optic. As I turn my magnification, my reticle and my object, they get larger and smaller in relation to each other. That The relationship doesn't change. So in a first focal plane optic, I can range on any power because one mil is always one mil no matter what power setting I have. All right. um, I found out yesterday your snipers have the M2010s. Okay, the M2010, the new optic that's on the M2010 is a first focal plane reticle. Right, so these guys are probably having a different learning curve now versus what they were using beforehand. Right, so they have, um, they're using, using a completely different optic, completely different reticle system. Right, so all that means to, to you guys is that it has to be on 10 power right, in order to do range estimation and hold offs. All right, to install the optic, first thing that we're going to do, all right, well, when you get out on the range, first thing we're going to do is zero your iron sights. All right, to do that, we're going to have to remove that cantilever base. Okay. So to remove the cantilever base, all right, if you look on the, on the front, on the left side of the throw levers, there's a locking tab there. That locking tab moves to the rear, and then you unlock these throw levers. Now, some of these throw levers are extremely tight. Okay, I mean extremely tight. If, they, if you get out on the range and they are so tight that you can't move them, that's fine. We can take, one of the instructors can take Allen wrenches and we can loosen them on the other side so we don't break things and start bending things. All right, once we get them locked down, all right. After you zero your irons, we're going to lock them back down. We're going to put your cantilever back on with your optic mounted. Now, once we do that and you zero, the only time you're going to take this cantilever base off again, there's going to be one reason and one reason only. And that is if your optic becomes damaged and unusable. Because if it does, then what? Well, if, if your optic becomes damaged and unusable, what are you going to have to do? Go to your irons, right? You've got to get this cantilever base off or you can't see to use your irons. Once you take this cantilever base off, you, put it, you can put it back on again. You will be re-zeroing, I guarantee you. Okay? It will not retain zero. As long as it stays on and stays mounted, we can take this, the, the optic on and off. Now, I'm going to show you how to do that and make it repeat. All right, to, so to install the optic, Right, you, you loosen the screws, and if you look underneath, how many of you had the, have had the optics off of these? A few of you. When you looked on the bottom of the rings, you saw the little slots where the screws are here, or the little tabs where the screws are? There are slots in your rail system. Right. Those line up in the slots on your rail system. Now, when you put it on there, you're going to notice there's some forward and back slop on there. So when I mount it, I'm going to mount it down on the rail. Now, where on the rail am I going to mount it? Wherever, exactly, wherever it works for the shooter. All right, when you do that, after we set the buttstock length, you're going to get down behind it in your normal firing position, all right, which will, for this is going to be, probably be the prone position. We get you down to the prone position, and you'll look through the optic. Right, they'll move it back and forth. Your buddy can move it back and forth on that rail system until you have a full field of view through it. Okay? We're not trying to wrap ourselves around the weapon. We're trying to set this thing up so it's comfortable for you right? and it fits you. So they're not all going to be in the same place. Right? Once we do that, you're going to take that, take that optic 
push it fully forward until it's in the front of those rail slots. Okay, the reason why we do that is because if I put it in there, let's say I put it in the middle of the slot or at the back of the slot, what do you think is going to happen when it fires? It's going to shift forward. It's going to shift forward until it hits right, the front of that slot. It's going to do it anyway, so you might as well start off there. All right, two problems can come in if we let it do it itself. One of which is it's going to take a while for it to seat, to fully seat, right, and you may have some zeroing issues. All right, the second one is repeatability. If I put it in the same place every time, do I have repeatability? Yes. All right, they guarantee that I can remove this optic and put it back on, and as long as I install it properly, I will have no more than one minute of angle movement. Right. I'm going to tell you from working with these, that's kind of one of those, uh, that, that's a, pretty much a CYA kind of thing. Okay. I fired these in the test tunnel and I took one, grabbed one off the rack, went and fired a 10 round group with it. Right. Went down, fired another 10 shot group, took the, uh, took the optic off and put it back on between every shot on that 10 shot group. And at 100 meters there was no deviation both of those shot groups were the same size. All right. That's as close to zero deviation as you're going to get. Now, mm -hmm. does that mean they're all going to be like that? Maybe, maybe not. All right. But if you do it right, this system is very, very accurate and very repeatable. Okay. Now, once we install these, right, fully forward in the rail slots, now we're going to take and hand tighten the nuts. Okay, once we do that, we need to torque them. Right, and that's very important for as far as getting these th this thing to repeat if you have to take it off and put it back on again. So, a couple of things we can do to torque. One of them is a T-handle torque wrench. Right? Your snipers have these because their optics are torqued to 65 inch-pounds. Right? That's the standard for, for this type of optics mounting system. Your optics should be also be torqued to 65 inch-pounds. Right, you can get these, they're in the supply system. Do you need one? No. Do you, have, do you have a tool that you can loosen and tighten those nuts with? Yes. Right, part of your combination tool, right, that socket fits on to your optic rings. All right, so I'm going to tighten these down hand tight, right, as tight as I can get them by hand. <coughs> now I'm going to take that socket, I'm going to put it on that nut. Wherever it lines up on that nut, okay, I'm going to take it and I'm going to turn it 90 degrees. Okay, by tightening that 90 degrees, consistently you, you can consistently achieve 65 inch pounds. Okay. Fully hand tight and a quarter turn will give you 65 inch pounds every time and it will repeat. Now once you do that and we torque them, we're going to go one step farther. Now we're going to take a paint marker right, and I'm going to paint across those nuts. That's giving you a reference mark. Okay, that does two things for you. What do you think one of those might be? If I need to tighten it back down again, I can retighten it until those, those marks line up, all right, and I've retorqued it. What's another one? What do you think another thing might be? Ah, it gives me a visual reference, just like they were talking about earlier with your gas system, your gas piston. If I see that line starting to do this, I know that my, my ring's coming loose. All right. Now, I'll tell you, if you torque these properly to 65 inch pounds, they're, they're not coming loose. All right, they're not coming loose very easily. Okay, the other real bad thing about not putting it fully forward in the, in the rail slots is that as it fires, it's going to continually move forward. All right, it's going to take you a long time to zero, and what's probably going to happen is your nuts are going to start to back off all right, until it becomes loose. So then we go from shooting groups like this to shooting groups like this. All right, so once we have that mounted, all 
All right, we talked about field of view. Tighten the torque of the rings. Now, the next step, all right, and this is probably one of the most important and one of the most overlooked, is focusing the reticle. And we talked about where, with the iron sights, where should your focus be? Tip of the front sight post. All right. When we're talking about an optic like this, where should your focus be? Right. On the reticle. If the reticle is not in focus, do you think you're going to have a hard time concentrating on it? All right. is, do you think your eye is going to try to make it be in focus? Yes. Well, what do you think that's going to do after a while? A very short while. Yes, will give you a splitting headache because your eye is constantly trying to focus on something that's out of focus and make it come into focus. All right. So to adjust the eyepiece and focus the reticle, if you look on the front of your ocular lens, right, right, right behind your power knob, there is a, there's a knurled ring there. That's your locking ring. All right. You're going to loosen that ring. All right. Once you loosen that ring, now I'm going to look through my optic. I don't care about anything else. I don't care what I can see through it. All right. You're going to look at something. You're going to look at a clear background. The best way to do it is look up, point the optic up at the sky so that the only thing that I can see is the reticle. Now I'm going to turn that ocular lens, and you won't be able to do it in here because there's, there's going to be too much distraction in what you can see. You're going to turn that ocular lens until that reticle comes in sharp and in focus. Okay, the best way to do that is to turn it one way or the other and see if it starts. You'll see it start to come into focus. And it's not going to be a small adjustment. You're not going to do a quarter turn. All right, you may have to do three or four revolutions. You'll see it start to come into focus. Keep turning until it comes into focus and then comes back out of focus again. And then turn it back the opposite way all right, until it comes back into, into sharp focus. By doing that, that will give you the best focus you can. All right, and the reason why I say it's overlooked is because that is one of the things that they normally don't teach with setting up optics, and it's very, very important, especially if you're looking through one of these things for a long period of time. All right, if, it's, if it's crisp and it's sharp and it's in focus, your eye's not straining to see it. All right, once you do that, then you turn the locking ring down, back down finger tight again. Okay, tomorrow we'll do that on the range and we'll make sure that they're in focus on the range. Okay, because you really need to see at a distance, look at something like the sky at a distance in order to make it work. All right, the next adjustment we have is parallax, parallax adjustment. The knob on the left hand side is your parallax adjustment knob. Now one of the real advantages to using a magnified optic is that I can see my target better. Right? I've got better situational awareness. Ideally what you should have is the reticle and the target both in focus and looking like they're on the same plane. Right? And you do that by making sure that they're both in focus. Now, parallax adjustment. That knob on the left hand side, once I do that, I'm going to focus on my target. I'm going to take that parallax knob and I'm going to turn it until the target comes in focus. All right, so now both of them are in focus. Usually, that will get you there. That will get your parallax out. To test that, you can get behind the rifle without moving the rifle. You can move your head slightly left and right and up and down. All right. If that target appears to move, the target will move, but the reticle should stay. If I put that reticle center mass, wherever that target goes, the reticle should follow it and should stay on center mass. If I'm moving my head and my target's going one way and my reticle's going the other way, you know you still have parallax in the optic. So reach up, make an adjustment. Check it again. Okay. It's very, very important to get the parallax out of there. The other thing we need to look at when you're actually firing is what's called scope shadow. Go ahead and look through your optic. Right, get centered behind it. Now move your head right and left and up and down. Right, what happens to what you can see? You start getting that little half moon there, right? the black half moon right and left and up and down. 
Okay? At long, the farther the distance is, the more this becomes pronounced. Right? If your parallax is not adjusted perfectly, if your parallax is adjusted perfectly, you can get away with a little bit of that. Right? If it is not adjusted perfectly, what's going to happen is your round will go opposite of wherever that scope shadow is. If, that, if you're seeing that little ring to the, the right-hand side, your round is going to go left right? because you're not looking straight through the optic. Right? So it's important to, have, to set it up right? so you're looking straight and square through the optic. Right? The way we do that, once we adjust your length of pull, get your eye relief set. Now we're going to adjust your cheek piece height. So when your face is down in your, in your firing position, your eye should be looking straight through the optic. Right? You shouldn't have to tilt your head over the side or do this or, or move it around some way. Right? When you place, it on, if you place your head on the, on the cheek piece, right? the best way to check that, close your eyes, put your head on the rifle, open your firing eye. You should be looking straight through the optic. Right. If you're looking up through the, over the top of it, or down, or down through the bottom of it, right, you know you need to adjust it a little bit. All right, your elevation and windage adjustments. Right, we talked about those. Your elevation is in one-minute angle increments, and your windage is in half-minute angle. Right, and we all understand about minute angle and what it does, right, or how much it is. All right, you also have a bullet drop compensator. If you look, the top series of numbers right, is your range in yards. Once we set this and once we zero this optic, and there are two different ways that we can zero it. Now I'm going to talk about both of those. When I adjust it, if I have to adjust to a different range, I can turn until that top number lines up with my witness mark on the top. All right, now we'll adjust for the range. How well do you think those work? They work very well. They work very well. Okay, when you look on the top of this, it says 308, uh, 308 Winchester, 168 grain. What you're going to be shooting in your M118 LR is 175 grain. All right. do, you think it may, do you think there's a difference in the ammunition? A little bit. And by little, I mean the difference in bullet drop at 1,000 yards is about 4.5 inches. All right. Very, very close. So these, these BDCs do work extremely well. All right, we're going to talk about, oh, once we, all right, so once we zero, all right, we're going to go out, we zero your irons, mount your optics, zero your optics. Okay. It's very, very important that you get a good, true 300-yard zero. All right, the reason why I say 300-yard zero is because all, all of what I'm going to give you for target engagement is based off a 300-yard zero. Okay, there's a couple reasons why we went with that. The biggest one being that it makes it easier for an SDM to engage from zero to about 350 meters or 350 yards. All you basically have to do is put the crosshair center mass, point and shoot, and you're going to hit that target. Beyond that, then we need to start doing something different, and we'll talk about what we're going to do when we get past that. All right, so once we zero, elevation and windage, if you look on the outside of these knobs, you'll see set screws on there. Right, we're going to do what's called slipping the turrets. So once you zero, we're going to loosen those set screws, and we're going to move your windage and elevation turrets. The windage turret, we're going to move until the zero line lines up with our witness mark. All right, and then tighten them back down. Now, be careful when you go to tighten these. Did you guys get Allen wrenches in your kits? You guys didn't get the boxes these, these came in, did you? No, that's right, because I saw them stacked up in the arms room. And the Allen wrenches are in there. Well, there should be one on, yeah, there's one on your multi-tool. All right, be very, very careful with those multi-tools. Using them on these, um, you will strip one of these screws out in a heartbeat. All right, most Allen wrenches have uh, a short side, I don't have mine are back there, 
They have a short side and a long side. Which side do you think you grab a hold of to tighten it? Short side. Short side. Now you grab the short side. That is all the, all the torque, all the pressure that you need to put on one of these screws. And everybody know what I mean by that, right? All right. You got a short side and a long side. You tighten grabbing a short side. Long side is if I need to put some torque on it because it's stuck and I need to loosen it. Now, your elevation turret. There's two ways we can zero that. Okay, one is that we can move it around with a 300 yard zero, we can move it around until the zero on the lower scale right, lines up with your witness mark. The other way you can do it with a 300 yard zero is turn it until your three lines up. Okay, what it, the difference is it depends if I want to use the BDC or if I want to click the turn. Um, I'm not going to make a decision on that right now. You know, I'm not going to tell you that we've got a decision on that right now because we, we need to see about zeroing here tomorrow right, and how we're going to do the rest of that. Now, once, however we do it, if you change your mind in the future, what do you think you, let's say I set this up and I zero it out with the lower scale because I don't want to use my BDC, I want to click my turn. If I change my mind down the road, and I decide I want to use my BDC, what should I do? Reslip the turret. Loosen it up, line it up so, you, so my 300 yard mark lines up, tighten it back down again. All right. As long as you slip the turret, which means you loosen these up enough so you're not moving anything in there, you can do that. All right. You can get away with it. So once we do that, you're zeroed. Now, why do I want to zero my turrets? Because I always have a reference point to go back to. Okay, I've always got my zero line. Doesn't matter what I click into these turrets, I can always go back to zero. All right, and we're going to be talking about spinning turrets and, and moving things around. All right. Target engagement. We determine our range to the target. Now, there's two different ways that we can engage. All right, one of which is to turn our elevation adjustment. Actually, three ways. One is we can use the BDC. Okay. The second one is that we can dial our elevation adjustments into, into our optic. Right. That's called a come up. Okay. The advantages to using come ups or using turn adjustments is that it's very precise and it is very repeatable. Okay. The downside to it is that if I engage at a different range, do I have to adjust again? Yes. If I engage at, let's say, 800 yards, and I have a target that pulls up, at, come, comes up at 300 yards, do I have to dial back? Yes, or I'm going to shoot way over. All right, I'm talking feet, not inches. Okay, so I need to, I need to reset it. That's why we zero your turrets. So you always have that, that, re, that ability to come back to zero. All right, there's a couple of reasons why these optics cost $1,200. Okay, one of which is that they are extremely reliable right, and extremely repeatable. Okay, my second way is to do hold-offs. We do hold-offs using the mill dot reticle. Okay, one of the things we, that we, use those, we can use those dots for is alternate aiming points. Once we get beyond that 300 meters where you're, or 300 yards where you're zeroed, we can use those dots to hold off. All we're doing is adjusting our aiming point. Okay, we're going to talk about that. The big advantage to that is it allows you to engage targets, especially multiple targets at, at different distances very, very quickly. I don't have to spin my turret. I don't have to move my BDC. All I do is adjust my aiming point and fire. Okay. But we need to remember where those are. So where do you think that comes in? Notebooks, right? Okay, the other thing that I'm going to give you is, is that data as well. All right, this is a trajectory chart for the M118LR fired out of the M14 EBR. Don't worry about writing this stuff down, guys. I'm going to give you these two. Well, you got them here. 
Matter of fact, let me do this right now. Those are yours. Tape them, tape them to your, keep them in your pocket. Tape them to your, to your stock. Whatever you want to do with them. Now, if you look at that chart, it's giving you the trajectory in yards. Right, again, notice that this is based off a of 300 yard zero. Right, it's very, very important that you get a true 300 yard zero. So it's giving you your inches of drop. All right, on a 300-yard zero, how much is this thing dropping at 1,000 yards? 300, almost 360 inches. All right. Can everybody see back there? See that real clearly back there? OK. Almost 360 inches. And that is why range estimation is so important. If I think a target is 800 yards away and it's only 500 yards away and I adjust for 800, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm going to shoot way over the top of him. If I think he's 500 and he's actually 750, how, what am I, now what am I going to do? Yeah, I'm going to scare the heck out of him when I put the bullet about 50, yard, 50 yards in front of him. Now skips off the ground. Now, the second line is your come ups. Okay. That is the amount that you're going to move your turret. So once you have a 300 yard zero, if you range your target okay, and he's 600 yards away, how many clicks are you going to move your elevation turret? Okay, 11. Good. We can't go 11.2 on this one because every click is one minute. Okay, so how much is that 11 clicks moving us, raising the trajectory? About 70 inches. Okay, that's 11.2 is the actual drop, the actual come up. Is 11 minutes going to get you there? Yes. Okay, it will get you there. All right, so you're going to round it to the nearest minute. All right, that 15.9, we're going to come up 16. Okay, 27.3, we're going to come up 27. Okay. These will give you, these come ups will give you first round hits out to 1,000 yards. All right, any questions on what we're going to do there? No, everybody, everybody tracking? All right, good, good. Okay, hold offs. Again, all hold offs is is we're using this reticle to adjust the aiming point, so we're not dialing the scope turrets. Say so here, the, the the upside here is that we don't have to dial the scope turrets. We don't have to remember to go back to zero in between engagements. All right, so it's very fast way. Especially if you're engaging multiple targets at, at different distances. Right. One of the reasons why we're gonna, I'm going to st stress hold off so much <coughs> is that the feedback that we've gotten from units that we've trained that have gone to theater is that for the most part, this is what they're using. Right. They're not dialing scope turrets, they're having to engage quickly, and they're using hold offs. All right, so for out to 300 yards, all you need to do is point and shoot. Put the crosshair center mass, squeeze the trigger, all right, and you're going to get a hit. All right, at 400 yards, at 400 yards now, we need to take that first mill dot down and put it center mass. Okay, at 500, that second, the second mill dot down. All right, we're going to put it center mass. 
Again, all we're doing is adjusting our aiming point based on the trajectory of the round. All right, at 600, now we're going to take that second mill dot down and we're going to slap it on top of his head. Okay. At 700, right, that bottom mill dot, we're going to put it right about where the head and neck are, somewhere in that area, and that's going to give you a hit. And again, all these are on your sheets, and I'm going to give you these, these as well that are laminated, so you'll have them to take the theater with you. All right, at 800 yards, the thick part of that reticle, where the reticle starts to get thick again, you're going to place that on top of his head, and you will hit. Now, how do you think, why do you think that works? Okay, I'm raising the, I'm changing the angle to adjust for my trajectory. We kind of run out here at 800 yards, about as far as we can go with this, because the biggest reason is because we run out of reticle to be able to use. All right, but it does work. We've used this. All right, it, it, trust me, it works. You guys are going to see it when you get out on the range. Okay. The biggest reason why it works is how much is it from one mill dot to the second mill dot? Every mill dot. One mill, right? How much is one mil? Three and a half minutes. All right, at 400 yards, how many minutes am I moving it? About three and a half minutes, right? So from center to that first mil dot is three and a half minutes. All, right, all it is is math. Again, you need to have your, your, your optic on maximum power for this to work. Okay, but it does work, and it's just math. All right. They said that range estimation was the biggest, single biggest factor in, uh, in failing to engage a target or failing to hit a target. Um, not sure, I'm so sure I agree with that. I think wind is probably a bigger factor than trajectory is. Or range as, or why do you think that is? Okay, that, yeah, that, that, that's one reason. Ah, is elevation, is trajectory a constant? Yes. Is wind a constant? Sorry, Anderson, is wind a constant? There, there are all kinds of problems associated with wind. All right. the, now, this trajectory, this ballistics table, all right, your wind drift, okay, it's in inches and in minutes. And it's also on that laminated chart. This is based off a 10 mile an hour full value wind. All right, what we mean by full value is the wind is blowing directly across from you, from right to left or left to right at a 90 degree angle. Okay, any windage chart that you don't see, if, you don't, if it doesn't tell you what the wind value is, it is assumed that it is a 10 mile an hour full value wind. That's kind of a default. So if you ever see one that, you know, a published one, and it doesn't tell you how fast the wind is blowing, that, that's, that's your assumption. Because right, that's kind of the standard. So, how are we gonna, what are we going to do about wind? <laughs> yeah, that's well. Say, can you say that again, Sergeant Anderson? Do something. Because the wind's doing something. This, this is an example, guys. Look at, look at 400 yards, 400 meters. Okay? 12.8 inches of drift. How wide is the inside silhouette? 19 and a half inches. So if you're aiming center mass, how much of the target do you have left and right of your center mass angle? Center mass angle. 10 inches. Your, your area of engagement 
get from 300 to 800. Now we just took the first step past 300, we're already making the target, go left or right, okay? This is important stuff, okay? Um, so what we're saying here is, is, is try to get your head wrapped around what we're trying to deliver and the effect that it has. How many guys have ever reached out and touched the windage knob on a light on your M16 or M4 in your qualification round? Really? You? One? If I had a pocket full of gold stars, you'd get all of them. Okay? Wind, as I said, wind is not a constant. Gravity is a constant. Okay? Wind is your enemy. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of an example. Okay? We were, I was in Australia in October shooting, uh, actually coaching the World Championships there. And we were working with a shooter, uh, and we had two minutes of left of left wind knob. So we were moving the bullet, we were at 900 yards, and we, had, and we were working with two minutes of left wind. In between shots, we went from two minutes of left wind to seven and a half minutes of right wind. So at 900 yards times nine and a half minutes of change, that's 85 inches of wind grip in between two shots, okay? Just to keep the guy in the center of the target. We adjusted the sight where it quakes on paper, it's 85 inches of wind grip in between consecutive shots. So that's how not constant <coughs> wind can be. And, just, and granted, just don't get me wrong, it takes a lot of practice to get really good to do that kind of thing. But if you don't do anything, you're not gonna have any success. Uh, I remember a quote of a guy I used to work with, the wind ain't never not worth nothing. Now it's not grammatically correct, but it's, it's epic when you think about the concept. If the wind is blowing, it's gonna move the bullet. That part of it is inevitable. If the, the biggest thing, and Sergeant Anderson said it, if the wind is blowing, right, and it's blowing enough to be a factor, do something. Because you've got two choices, do something or do nothing. Right? If you do something, you have two, two options or two, out, two possible outcomes, success or failure. If you do nothing, I guarantee you there's only one outcome, and you're going to miss. Okay? So, so do something. There are, the reason why he's saying that the wind is your enemy is because it does all kinds of nasty tricks. Is the wind constant? No. Is it constantly blowing in the same direction? No. What else is it not doing? Not constantly blowing. Not constantly blowing at the same speed. All right, it gusts. You have let-ups. Does it change direction? Yes. Is it blowing the same direction all the way from you to the target? Maybe. Maybe not. Okay. What could cause that? Terrain. terrain. Biggest thing is terrain. All right, if, you were to take, if we were to take wind flags out and set them out between these buildings, you'd get an eye opener to see what air does as it moving, moving between these buildings, moving between mountains, moving between cliffs, all right, in valleys. Now, if you're out in a target range and you're shooting, you have what? Now, if you're out competing, what do you, what do you have, Sergeant Javasio? Range flags, right? Wind indicators. If you're out in the field, do you have wind flags? Do you have wind indic indicators? Yes. You have all kinds of wind indicators. It's not a big old red piece of fabric flapping in the breeze, but there's all kinds of wind indicators. All right. What can some of them be? Mirage. Mirage, yeah. <coughs> Mirage, yeah. That's kind of getting a little, little advanced for what you got. All right. Yep. Grass, trees, yeah. dust, clothing on the target. smoke, clothing on the target. <laughs> Anything that I can see move in the wind is probably going to, can, should be giving me some idea. Am I going to know the exact velocity? No. All right. But if, it, if at my position, I'm seeing or I'm feeling the wind, and I'm like, well, that wind, it feels like it's about five miles an hour. And then I look, and 50 yards in front of me, I see all the grass laid down going in the opposite direction. Like Sergeant Arcalarius said, that, that, that's called a clue. 
right? Yeah, they, they, something, something happened. Which one do you think I, I need to worry about? Probably need to worry about that one ripping out there, right? So what do you think the answer is for shooting in the wind? All right, did do something. Exactly. What do you think the best way to uh, the best way to get good at shooting in the wind is? Shooting the wind. Most shooters don't like to shoot in the wind. Why? Because it's hard. If it was dead calm, you know, all the time, it would come down to basically who can aim better, squeeze the trigger, and who's got the more accurate rifle, you know, in a competition, right? Sergeant Lewis? Okay. You know, it's, it's the win. Right? I, and win, win will do funny things. There are no set easy answers to this, guys. You know, actually, if, if, if somebody back there has got a, got a foolproof solution, <laughs> do something. All right, so we can... Go ahead, Sergeant Anderson. Did you guys remember Sergeant Artillery talking about how wide the target was and how to, how to gauge the hold-off was as much? Yeah, we're going to hit hold-offs here in a minute. All right. Mm. Next slide. Did you want to... Okay. All right. So... When we're adjusting our scope, we're going to click in windage. Right. So look at your scope. If I want to turn it, if I want to move my point of impact to the right, which way do I want to move? Yep, I want to move it. I'm going to turn it down or toward me. If I want to move it left, I move it forward or away from me. Now. One thing I've seen that messes shooters up doing this, your M16 and your M4, which way do I move to strike on my round if I want to move it to the right? The right, the forward, the opposite direction. These optics are the opposite direction of what you guys are used to turning your windage knobs on your M16s. Or even the windage knobs on these? Yep. Okay. They are different because of the way this optic is built with that inner tube and the way it's got to push on it to get it to adjust. Yep. All right. The other way we can do this is to hold off. Okay. I can use the mill dot reticle to hold off. All right. If I look on my chart and my target's 400, uh, 400 yards away and I have a 10 mile an hour wind. All right, and it is full value, blowing 90 degrees from right to left. Which way am I going to hold? Into the wind. Good. Into the wind. It's important to remember that because I've seen a lot of the opposite happen. We have to hold off how much for a 10 mile an hour full value wind? Look at your chart at 400. So about three and a half minutes. All right, how much is three and a half minutes? What's three and a half minutes equal? One mil, right? If I want to hold that picture is a little bit skewed. I, I want to take that one mil, that first mil dot, and hold it center mass. All right, and that's under a perfect world. I've got a, I've got a 10 mile an hour full value wind. It's blowing, you know, constant. Uh, and I know my, and I've got my range dialed in. Now, one thing I put in there: if you are using, if you're going to hold using your mill dot reticle for windage, you have to use, or I suggest strongly that you use your come ups for elevation. All right? And the reason I'm saying that is if you try to hold off using both, and let's say now you've got a 20 mile an hour wind, and you're trying to hold off, you, you're trying to hold off for windage and elevation. Where's your aiming point at? Yeah, in the middle of nowhere, exactly. All right, so if you're going to hold off for wind, use your come ups for elevation. Right. And honestly, it's personal preference. 
All right, what works best for you? I don't like, I'll, I'll spin an elevation knob all day long, but I do not like touching that windage knob. Don't know why, just me. I would much rather hold off for the wind because I'm more comfortable doing it. All right, and it works for me. If it works for you, great. If it works better that you click windage in, click windage in. All right. Anybody, Sergeant Anderson, Sergeant Lewis, anything you, you want to add? The, the, the key point is when I say do something, just, what, just what Sergeant LaForce said, you don't do anything, you know what the results are going to be. Okay? If you can put on too much, you can either not put on enough. But if you don't put anything on, you know you're not going to have the desired effect. Okay? And it takes practice. I mean, that nasty booger still whips the best out of it, but you can't win if you don't play. Okay? You got to try something. All right, any, any questions on any, anything we've covered as far as target engagement? Like I said, I'm going to give you all these charts. I'm going to give them laminated. You can take them to the range with you. You're going to take them to the theater with you. All right, they're yours. And try this stuff on the range. See which works best for you. All right, different shooters have different preferences, and some things work better. Like I said, if, if, if you're more comfortable clicking windage, click windage. If you're more comfortable holding off, hold off. I suggest that you, tr that you try both. Right, and give each one a fair chance. See which works better for you. Right, it might be a combination of the two. You know, I can almost guarantee you what works best for me probably will not work best for everybody else in this room. That's about the only guarantee I can give you.